and welcome back to a new video. Today we'll be kind of revisiting or expanding on a past video, at least a recent video, if we're depending on how we're defining this. So we're going to be talking about the history of the Redwood Empire route for the Northwestern Pacific. General outline of how we're going to go through this one is we're going to go through the early conglomeration, the construction, kind of going to gloss over that because there is a far better video on that than here. So that's getting a really quick gloss over. Um, it's called Fire in the Mountain. I would say I'm going to link it, but I have a terrible uh, track record of actually doing that. So, I mean, again, in most case, best case scenario, uh, Google, um, just Northwestern Pacific History usually pops it up for uh, Fire in the Mountain. Yeah, I, I, again, I would say I would do that, but at the rate I, at the rate I, when I, based on how my production flow and these go, like when I record it, when I post it are not remotely the same time. So anyways, yeah, ignoring that. Then we're talking briefly about the passenger trains, their inevitable collapse, and some of what's going on in the present day. And here's a picture of the newer NWP um, freight trains somewhere in uh, the North Bay. Um, let me just kick that over. So this is a map of the Northwestern Pacific Railroad, I believe, at its greatest extent, after it had been fully consolidated all the way up to Eureka. I'm assuming that this line is still shown on a map. This is probably pre-World War One, at least pre-America getting involved in World War One. Yeah, you know, starts in 19 what 1914, and we didn't get involved until 1916. So I'm assuming this is a pre-1916 map. Anyways, it was, the NWP was created. Uh, through the merger of a dozen or so railroads that ran between Marin and Humboldt counties in the northern coastal range of California. Of these railroads, roughly half were owned by the SP and roughly half were owned by the Santa Fe. After they realized that two lines were never going to be viable in the north coast, they decided to merge all their railroads into one. This was quite an accomplishment because many of the railroads had different gauges. Some were standard, some were narrow, so on and so forth. Partially due to, this was partially due to the fact that many of them were former logging railroads and they used whatever gauge they could get away with to haul lumber because, I mean, they, it, a lot of the railroads, like, in this area that were logging didn't connect anything, so they just used whatever random gauge they could get spare equipment for and, you know, shipped up there. And by shipped up there, I mean, like, literally they would, like, buy any random, like, rail equipment from some other railroad, who gives a crap what gauge it is, build the railroad to that gauge and then just haul the equipment up there, use it, and then dismantle the railroad. Kind of an interesting history that I may get into someday, but not entirely right now. In 1906, the two companies merged their various holdings into one company, and it was called the Northwestern Pacific Railroad. Other than a minor setback in 1906, which was you know, the Great San Francisco Earthquake, they started constructing connections between the various railroads and re-gauging as much of the line as they felt was necessary. Even until the end of service, there was a narrow gauge railroad in coastal Marin and Sonoma counties, and the narrow gauge uh, line would keep running until sometime during the Great Depression. Anyways, here is uh, the map zoomed in if we're looking at the northern end of the line from Willits North up into Humboldt County. At one point, it did reach all the way to Trinidad, and there was this little branch going off from Willits. And then a few subsequent branches and uh, logging railroads in the Humboldt Bay area. And we're going to get into the construction of the NWB. The construction of the Northwestern Pacific was arduous to say the least. Building in the Eagle River Canyon was a mess. There were a lot of issues with it. Mostly it was down to the cheapness of the Southern Pacific and the unfriendly geology of the area. The geology in the area is influenced by the confluence of three major tectonic plates off of, off of Cape Mendocino. I forgot to throw in that picture of the uh, where the tectonic plates are. But anyways, uh, the three plates being the North American plate, the Pacific plate, and the Gorda plate, they all come together. And since I'm not a geologist, more history teacher, and, you know, dabbling in chemistry and geology and chemistry are not necessarily the same thing. Also, the geologists are not entirely sure why this is true either, at least based on the geology that I was able to read and understand. Part of the issue is is that there's stresses moving in multiple directions at any given time which causes the land to break up in weird and unpredictable ways and another thing that i was reading is that another issue with uh, the right of way is that parts of it were built below the flood line in an area with lots of flooding and there also was a huge population in this area um from what i told there basically is nobody and there never really was a huge population in the eel river canyon 
But that being said, the geology is fairly unknown. It's an area prone to flooding. And with the, you know, just general unfriendliness of the area, uh, any random rock slide, earthquake, rainstorm, what have you, can literally cause the um, land under the tracks to just completely collapse in, uh, leaving your tracks just over a gap, completely collapse into the river, um, tunnels caving in all the time. It's almost a given that there would be slides um, and other ge ge geological um, shenanigans. And uh, one of the geology reports I read actually described as building a beach on, um, building a railway on an open beach that just, you know, you're building it on top of sand, the sand's going to give. And that's uh, how bad the construction in the Eel River Canyon is. Or at least the geology. Anyways, we're going to talk briefly, or at least maybe not briefly, probably the most about the uh, passenger trains along the Northwestern Pacific. These are some of the old heavyweight cars on the NWP, or at least that they had. This, from what I remember looking up the picture, is taken sometime in the 60s, right around the time they dis... not discontinued. Dis, yeah, discontinued, almost disconnected. Um, but discontinued their uh, locomotive hauled passenger services along in the most of their railway. And from what I can tell, the NWP hit its, its heyday, relatively speaking, pretty much after it was open. And it also hit problems immediately. And from what I can tell, it was closed briefly after it opened due to a flood in the Hill River Canyon. But the NWP was primarily a timber hauling railway and also other forestry and agricultural products from Humboldt County. But since this train again focuses on this train, my train of thought is is um, all, all sorts of scrambled right now, but um, uh, anyways, this, this channel is mostly about pasture trains, so we're going to be talking mostly about them and not the freight trains. So we're going to be talking about the local service along the Northwestern Pacific. So looking at an SP schedule from roughly the 1920s, the... There were six daily round trips from Tiburon, Tiburon or Sausalito, whichever their main ferry terminal was. I'm just, I totally didn't put that in the notes. Thank, thank you, thank you, past me. Anyways, there were six trains to a town north of Santa Rosa where the line split to go towards Jenner on the coast. This is about 59 rail miles north of San Francisco. Two of these daily trips continued out to Duncan Mills along the Russian River, and one continued to Hillsburg and stopped. Another continued to U Ukiah in Mendocino County and stopped, and two continued all the way to Eureka. One of the Eureka trains was an overnight train that carried a Pullman sleeper that was carried to Fort Bragg over the California Western or the Skunk train. There were also other trains that ran on the Northwestern Pacific besides the trains that ran on its main line. There were trips up to Point Reyes, five of which ran every day, four ran every day except Sunday. Two were daily, excluding weekends, and one was a Saturday-only train, with one being a Sunday-only train. And then there were also two trains a day to Glen Ellen, which was a um, just north of Sonoma. It's roughly in between uh, what's now Vallejo and Marin County. There's a little like valley in there. And there was a third train on the weekend. And the NWP also had interurban service in Marin County. And I covered that in a separate video about the interurbans around the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. Most of the trains from what um, I can tell were tertiary trains by SP standards with respect to their service level and again relative to the rest of the SP system. And showing this picture here considering this was like 1960s equipment or at least their equipment in the 1960s. I'm pretty sure that exclude until the RDCs were in, uh, or the, the RDC because there's only one of them was introduced that the NWP was a completely heavyweight subsidiary. And considering the NWP was a subsidiary that was created to haul timber products out of Mendocino and Humboldt counties, it makes sense that their passenger service um, was an obligation and then they ran that obligation until the end of passenger service. Not to mention passenger trains to extremely rural areas were there mostly to haul mail. Normally I would talk about food service, but I can't find any menus from the NWP, and considering these trains were less important than trains like the Owl down the San Joaquin Valley, I can't imagine they had anything better than them or anything similar to them, or dissimilar rather. And uh, this is a picture of the passenger trains like right before they got the um, RDC. As you can tell, they had gone to the Silver um, 
train bodies with a red strip with North Northwestern Pacific on it, like most other SP trains were at the time. And then after the, towards the end, they are given the RDC service. I got this off of, I think, one of their Facebook pages. I don't know who posted it. If you know or are that person, please let me know. I am sorry I did not credit you because, again, we're note-taking sucks sometimes. This channel is a definition of a passion project. I'm just going to blatantly say that. Anyways, towards the end of the NWP's passenger trains, they ran an RDC between Willits and Eureka. The RDC ran between 1957 to the creation of Amtrak in 1971. Services south of Willits largely collapsed before World War II. By the beginning of the war, their service was down to two daily round trips between San Francisco and Eureka with all the other, from what I can tell, most if not all the local service entirely gone by then. And as for other services running on the NWP, up until at least 1936, there was service as far as Point Reyes, and up, which was up to six round trips per day at max. And by 1947, there was only one train per day to Eureka, and it was the overnight train. This train was running with chair car sections and compartments. And at the end, when the service was truncated to just Willits, they were using this RDC-3 on the screen. And this is the type that had the mail room, baggage, and compartment area for seating, or seating area, baggage compartment, mail room. Read that backwards the first time. And uh, sorry about that. Anyways, the beginning of the end of the Northwestern Pacific was the 1964 Christmas Day flood. This was historic. It was a thousand year flood that hit the North Coast. What happened was there was heavy snow in the Trinity Mountains and just Cascade Range in general. And this was followed up by a warm storm from Hawaii, colloquially known as the Pineapple Express. The storm caused all the snow to melt and flooded the Eel and Trinity Rivers and probably others that are scattered around the North Coast and Southern Cascade Mountains. The rivers had so much water going through them that the Eel River was putting out as much water as the Mississippi River on average. Which, again, mind you, the, the Eel River is like nowhere near as wide as the Mississippi. It uh, inundated and wiped out a few whole towns. And the NWP that ran through the Eel River Canyon was completely destroyed. And this was about 100 miles of track that took them 177 days to fully rebuild after the flood. And the Christmas flood is basically what did the NWP in a you know, long run. This was, may not have been like the full-on death blow, but this was definitely like the... They're just going from we're reasonably profitable to we're just like going like head first into into you now the end. And the flood, by the way, was devastating beyond the north coast. There was actually severe damage all the way from Portland to Sacramento, um, including the Steel River Bridge in Portland being shut down from a stent that I found while reading um, about this. Southern Pacific was forced to keep the rail line open by the ICC, and after the flooding, they did didn't want to keep the railroad open north of Willits. And at this point, we were well into the point where the ICC's regulation was making trucking cheaper than rail. Also, note about that, that trucking um, was only artificially cheaper than railroading due to regulations. It's not actually cheaper, at least now, depending on what you're hauling. And timber is usually the, the most um, lucrative, well, not the most lucrative, but one of the more lucrative industries for rail since it's heavy and relatively not valuable and doesn't need to be anywhere quickly. So usually uh, lumber is like prime business for a short line railroad. Anyways, according to transportation industry estimates, at least pre-pandemic and inflation, rail costs were roughly a quarter for trucking costs. So for example, trucking costs something like 28 cents per ton mile versus trains costing seven cents. But after the railroad was reopened, the SP more or less tried to offload the NWP onto anyone else if they couldn't outright abandon it. The SP more or less continued to pout until 1978 when there was a fire in Tunnel 27 on September 6th, and the line would remain closed until December 10th, 1979. And according to some reports, the SP drug its feet to try justifying abandonment of the line. And after the route reopened, only about half of the traffic returned to the rails. And in September of 1983, the SP came up with a solution to what they called the most expensive rail line in America, which was just to unilaterally abandon the line and not tell the ICC. The line was ordered to reopen the following March and was subsequently sold off to a man named Brian Whipple of the Eureka Southern Railway, which was formed to take over the uh, services north of Willits. And the railway even tried to revive tourist service as seen here by the, the North Coast Daylight, which was running. I think some of it actually was XSP equipment and some of it was X-Great Northern equipment. 
And this short train ran between Willits and Eureka during the summer season. And it wasn't long until the uh, Eureka Southern was facing problems. And this eventually led to the collapse in 1989 when the state created the North Coast Rail Authority, which took over the railroad and then leased the tracks to the North Coast Railroad, which I believe at that point was publicly or at least quasi-publicly owned in a similar deal as Amtrak. And this arrangement would last until the shutdown of the line north of Willits in 1998 due to storm damage. And this time, the FRA is the one who finally pulled the plug on the railroad because the state generally is like... A, 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 just like quick quick history lesson with California, the governor at the time was actually anti-spending money on infrastructure, so it kind of makes sense that this happened. Um, I can't remember what his name was, but anyways, I remember like one of his campaign promises was that he wasn't going to spend any more money than they already were on like public infrastructure. And that was a campaign promise. So go figure. I mean, as to why this railroad didn't really work out, because we were unwilling to spend money on it, or at least the governor was at this point. But anyways, that's kind of one of those things that like never really gets mentioned in this uh, in the retellings of the story of like, oh, the government was unwilling to spend money on this. It's like, yeah, because the governor was, and for whatever stupid reason, was anti like infrastructure spending, which is like the one spending most politicians approve of. <laughs> at least that isn't like core things the government does, like justice or defense or something. Anyway, and then this year's pictures of the NCRA hauling their traffic up and down the Eel River Canyon, their take on the um, tourist train, which I think this is Arcata, or at least between Eureka and Arcata, that kind of looks like that, or it could be further south. I'm not really sure. I'm not the person that can, like, look at a bridge and be like, ooh, I know exactly where that is when it was built, and all the, like, biographical information. As I tell my students, I'm not a computer, and I'm not hooked up to the internet constantly. And I mean, again, I could just do, I could edit this, but eh, I'm not doing it. <clears throat> Anyways, the line would remain closed until 2009 when the state, or when the line started being reopened between Shellville and Windsor. The first services were three freight trains per week running the route and was fully reopened for regional rail service in 2017. Currently, Smart has bought the right-of-way from Sonoma County line and there are rumblings of the line being opened as far as Willits to connect to the California Western. I've, I think that would make sense. I honestly think it should be reopened further than that. But again, or at least there should be rail further north than Willits. But as far as I can tell, um, opening it as far as Willits isn't necessarily a given. And they are trying to build a trail, at least according to one great senator's grand vision, they're trying to build a trail. Um, but anyways, if they did actually reopen the line to Willits, there would be a trail running parallel to the rail line. And there are currently issues with, um, at least last I heard that the government potentially screwing up the application to convert it to a rail trail that might get its, uh, easements voided. <laughs> oh, well, leave, leave it to our government to be competent. Anyways, there's also, um, grumblings that they might try to keep the line open to Willits, but at least last I checked, that got denied, so I mean... Again, don't really know what's going to happen to the, like, Willits to Cloverdale section, but if they did keep the line open at least as far as Willits, it would lead to the weird case where it would take three rails just to get, like, a haulage of rocks from a quarry to the, like, class ones, which is just some weird stuff that hasn't actually happened, I think, since, like, um, the 1800s, <laughs> like, back when they started letting the railroads all merge into just, like, like... Smaller by today's standards, but like regional-ish railroads, so I don't really get um, why we'd want that system back. Where it'd be like Quarry to Cloverdale is the like skunk train, and then Smart's taking it from Cloverdale to Shellville, and then it's California Northern from Shellville to Cordelia. It's like, again, why? <laughs> Anyways, this state's a mess, but uh, that being said, this is kind of the end of it, and uh, again, the future is possibly a rail trail like this or abandonment and just slowly sliding into the um, river. Also, don't really know how they're going to maintain a trail in um, an area where, like, the land literally could just melt under your feet in the rain. Don't know. Not an engineer. Not a senator. Anyways, going to leave it there. Hope you enjoyed. I will see you in the next one. I'm kind of making these whenever I have time, which is usually not very often, considering school teacher. It's the middle of the school year. <laughs> Anyways, I'll... Bother me in the Discord. There is one of those people have been bothering me on there. Eventually, I'm going to do an all history, or at least what I would do with the NWP. Basically, just a long mess of uh, video that I have no idea where it's going to go, and I that I have a map, map I made. Well, <laughs> we'll see where that goes.
Anyways, I will see you in the next one.